Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled, The South is the Nation's Number One Economic Problem, The South and the Great Depression. I've divided this discussion into four parts, an overview of the U.S. economy in the 1920s, a discussion of the onset of the Great Depression, an overview of the New Deal, and how the Roosevelt administration addressed the South as the number one economic problem in the U.S. Let's begin with an overview of the U.S. economy in the 1920s. After a short but sharp depression in 1921 and 1922, prosperity prevailed in most of the U.S. economy. Overall, the gross domestic product rose by 40% between 1922 and 1929, with leading industries being hydroelectric power, providing cheap industry to drive the rest of the economy, and mass consumer industries. Durables like automobiles, appliances, and electronics, that is radios, began the change in the U.S. from a producer-dominated to a consumer-dominated economy. To spur this economy, we see a new industry arise, advertising. Advertising became big business in the 1920s, using newspapers, magazines, and radio, as well as psychological techniques to drive demand for durable goods and consumables. In 1920, the U.S. Census recorded that for the first time, more people lived in towns and cities than in rural areas. The South dragged behind, with almost three-quarters of its residents living in rural areas in 1920. This meant that the urban-based economy was very badly distributed, with a wider gap than the national average indicates. Most of the growth and prosperity of the U.S. economy in the 1920s went to the people outside the U.S. South. Rather than share the rising prosperity, the South found itself plagued by what came to be called sick industries, agriculture and textile manufacturing. Agriculture's problems were many. Farm ownership was low and oddly bifurcated. Large agribusiness farms grew in size, and tiny farms that could not support their owners grew in number. Cotton prices fell over the decade, partly because of currency deflation, partly because of competition from India and other cotton-producing countries. Although southern farmers continued to plant cotton, the boll weevil infestation that had begun in Texas in the 1890s made it to the Atlantic seaboard by the end of the 1920s and ruined cotton crops extensively. Even though this might have been good for the macro economy, Individual farmers could not switch to other crops quickly enough, and many lost their farms. There was an entire infrastructure of processing plants, gins and oil pressing plants, and finance that did not change rapidly enough to accommodate even those farmers who diversified their crops. Consequently, many marginal farmers lost their farms, and many large farms laid off tenants. Seeking to stabilize commodity prices, Oregon Senator Charles McNary and Iowa Representative Gilbert Hogan proposed federal legislation to subsidize basic crops. President Calvin Coolidge vetoed it in 1924, 1926, and 1927. Coolidge also refused to provide federal relief funds during the Mississippi floods of 1926 and 27 that left much of the most productive land in the South ruined. Farm problems like these increased the great migration of black and white farm workers to urban-based industries in the South and the North. Textile manufacturing struggled too. Mills had moved from the higher wage northeast to the south to reduce wages, and though there was a time when local investors built mills, they usually sold those to northerners quickly, or northerners brought capital into the south. My point is that mills paid subsistence wages and sent profits out of the region to stockholders. Few mills modernized because investors did not reinvest and tool-making industries that supplied high-value-added machinery to the mills did not develop. In 
An example of this is seen in the Museum of Fort Payne, Alabama, the sock-making capital of the world in the 1920s. It has no machinery made in the South. Its specialized sock weaving machines all came from Rhode Island. Consolidation of the mill business concentrated mills into fewer and fewer hands, which led to closings as well as these businesses becoming subject to the demands of financiers and fewer numbers of large stockholders. Many of these same issues held true for textile mills and workers in the Northeast, but because there was relatively little alternative industrialization in the South, the slow failure of the textile industry had a devastating impact. After 1925, Observers began seeing signs of trouble in this economy, but didn't necessarily understand what was happening. Much of what we know now about economic downturns came from tools we developed to examine the Great Depression. With hindsight, we can see an unhealthy concentration of wealth in the industrial sector that mirrored problems of concentration in agriculture and the southern textile industry. Profits outstripped wages during the boom years, helped by a Supreme Court that hobbled workers' action and the ongoing legality of so-called yellow dog contracts by which workers pledged to not join a union. Workers had few ways to pressure employers for higher wages. Concentration of industry is also reflected in the boom in mergers that itself reached industrial scale in the late 1920s. By 1930, Businesses merged at the rate of 1,000 per year, and 100 large corporations controlled almost 50% of the U.S. economy. Furthermore, speculation was rife in the stock markets of the U.S. Two tax cuts under President Coolidge poured cash into the economy, and investors speculated with it. Although only 1 million Americans held stock in 1929, Many of the largest banking houses held vast amounts, and many of those used the then legal process of investing bank deposits in risky stocks at inflated prices. One of the most pernicious problems was unfettered buying on margin. This is the practice of purchasing stocks with only a down payment in the hopes that the price you sell them for makes more than the total value plus interest plus profit. If the price of the stock increases, the investor is good. If it plummets, the investor is sunk. We'll talk a little more about the stock market in a moment, but let's look at one leading economic indicator that was faltering and raised few eyebrows before the onset of the Great Depression. Housing starts are a leading economic indicator meaning that they signal the future of the economy before other indicators like wage growth, which is a lagging indicator. You can see from this graph that housing starts track the rise and fall of the economy, climbing after World War I, even though there was a sharp depression in 1921 and 1922, then rising to a peak of 937,000 in 1925. But economists and policymakers missed the three-year downturn in 1926 through 1928 that should have alerted them to problems. The large drop from 1928 to 1929 is distressing, as it should have alerted economy watchers but did not. The starts from 1930 through 32 indicate how severe the depression was. If we only knew then what we know now. In this section, we'll discuss the onset of the Great Depression. The most common tale we hear about the Great Depression is that it was the direct result of the stock market crash of October 24 and 29, 1929. While there is just enough truth to this to make it an easy explanation, it's not at all the sole reason for the Depression. Rather, in addition to it, and many structural weaknesses in the U.S. economy, the Depression was exacerbated by rolling failures of domestic and international finance. One of the reasons we believe the stock market crash caused the Depression is because it's something we can track. 
We have data for it when our data collection at the time was just simply poor. We didn't have the economic tracking tools that we have now. This is not to say that the crash wasn't part of the series of unfortunate events that became the Great Depression. Just how bad was the stock market crash? At first it wasn't all that bad, even if it was frightening. Black Thursday, the first loss of value, occurred on October 24, 1929, with the real fall taking place on Black Tuesday of the following week, October 29th. The prices of stocks fell from their inflated peaks. Then there was a recovery late in the year, but the damage was done to investor confidence. Buying on margin, borrowing short-term money to speculate in stocks, then paying it and interest back when the price shot up, led many to simply not be able to pay, and this rippled through the economy. The crash continued, bottoming out in the spring of 1932, but the stock market did not recover its 1929 value until the mid-1950s. The crash did not cause, or even really trigger, the Great Depression but it was one of many economic shocks that sucked money out of the economy, reduced business liquidity without backup streams of available revenue, and made consumer confidence plummet. At all times after World War I, if Americans didn't buy consumer durables, the economy didn't function well. And when people are afraid that they'll not be able to get money in the future, they won't buy durable goods. One of the greatest reasons that the stock market crash developed into the Great Depression was that President Herbert Hoover's administration did not respond well and responded with the wrong tools. In his defense, economic theories that explained the Depression and how government spending could stop it, the theories of John Maynard Keynes, didn't exist until the 1930s and 1940s, a response to the Depression and World War II. Hoover's fiscal policy of belt tightening made things worse. The Federal Reserve tightened the money supply by over one-third when expanding the money supply might have helped, and Hoover thought balancing the budget would put money back into the economy. But it did not. It merely starved the federal government. Hoover stressed private relief too long. He cajoled businesses to avoid layoffs and lowering wages but they could not hold, and private charity was soon overwhelmed. Afterwards, people couldn't get jobs or the help they needed. Beginning in 1931, Hoover realized the federal government had to help, but he could not bring himself to provide direct relief to entities or people. He first created the Emergency Committee for Unemployment in August 1931 to coordinate activities of welfare agencies, but he did not furnish federal funds. This was very much in keeping with how Hoover had successfully provided for Belgian relief in World War I, but the fundamentals were different in the 1930s. Hoover's National Credit Corporation was similar. He tried to coordinate private banks making short-term loans to weak banks, but the federal government did not provide guarantees to fully compensate in the event of loss, so big banks refused to assume such risk. Hoover's Reconstruction Finance Corporation was like the Federal Reserve in that it operated independently of the government and loaned money to state-chartered and rural banks. The Federal Reserve loaned to nationally chartered banks. This was a moderately successful program that lasted to 1957. Under Hoover, at the very depth of the Depression in July 1932, the RFC was authorized to loan money to state and local governments and could be used for relief. This had to be repaid from future tax receipts. The Depression was international in scope. Most of Western Europe had not recovered from World War I. The total of Germany's reparations per the Treaty of Versailles was not negotiated out until 1929. Germany made its last payment in September of 2010. Consequently, England and France had not repaid their U.S. loans. They also had not recovered. 
their economies were just sputtering along. Another weakness was that banking houses were highly interconnected. Since there was no lender of last resort, the role in the U.S. played by the Federal Reserve, banks made risky loans to each other, and if a big one fell, it could take even national banks with it. The most robust economy in the Western world in the late 1920s then was that of the U.S. When its stock market began falling in 1920s, panic ensued in the international financial circles, stock markets and banks. Banks began calling loans and gold fled from one market to another because there was no safe haven where financiers could park their money. To add to international problems, the U.S. passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff in 1930 that increased duties on 20,000 goods and was the second highest tariff in U.S. history. This led to round after round of retaliatory tariffs. Although it seemed to work for U.S. manufacturers by raising profits and their ability to keep workers employed, when the major Austrian bank, the Kreditsanstalt, failed in 1931, the resulting decrease in circulating money exposed the problems of the high tariff. The Credit Anstalt bankruptcy came about when the Austrian government forced it to take on the debt of another bank. When it fell, it took down the banking system of Europe. Although rescued by state action, as it failed, it called in all of its loans, which state banks across Europe could not meet, thus bankrupting them. This both sucked money out of the international finance system and reduced confidence in the banking system. Many people avoided using banks as problems rippled outward. By 1932, the bottom had fallen out of the U.S. economy. Although economic numbers are not reliable, it appears unemployment averaged 33% across the nation, with underemployment wretchedly high, too. State and local governments could not meet their debt obligations and resorted to paying the remaining public employees in script, such as college professors, or shutting down most functions entirely. When Franklin D. Roosevelt took office, he immediately declared a bank holiday, closing all banks across the country for a week because there had been a nationwide run on banks in the previous month that was intensifying. FDR's style was freewheeling, and his attitude was, if one thing didn't work, try another. So the New Deal became a bewildering mishmash of agencies and programs that we cannot decipher here. Nevertheless, let's get an overview of the New Deal and look at a couple of its programs that specifically address the South. The New Deal did not fix the Depression. And in some ways, FDR's policies made it worse. But the New Deal is a singular time in U.S. history that continues to be a touchstone for many. FDR was elected president in November 1932 and inaugurated on March 4, 1933. From then until June 16, 1933, the 100 days, his administration and Congress passed 15 major pieces of legislation to provide direct and indirect relief to poverty-stricken individuals and their state and local governments. Historians sometimes call this the first New Deal, followed by a second New Deal in the years 1935 through 1938. Many of the first New Deal relief programs were public works, and some earned the epithet of make-work programs. Some of these you've heard of, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and the Federal Emergency Relief Act that also provided grants to governments for salaries and local relief. Adjustment and recovery programs are almost as familiar, the first Agricultural Adjustment Act and the National Industrial Recovery Act. It was the Supreme Court's 1935 declaration that the National Industrial Recovery Act was unconstitutional that separates the first from the second New Deal. The last major body of legislation in the 100 days concerned banking and monetary reform. The U.S. abandoned the gold standard for its money on April 19, 1933, which immediately inflated the currency, helping debtors. <laughs> 
the Federal Securities Act and the Glass-Steagall Act put the brakes on unfettered risk in the stock market and banking sectors. The Home Owners Loan Act and the Farm Credit Act made a new stream of revenue available for small homeowners and farmers and established the now familiar standard of a 30-year mortgage. Four programs in the first New Deal had significant and direct impacts on the southern United States. The Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, provided jobs in rural areas principally for young men in urban areas who, authorities thought, were likely to radicalize. Communists and, to a lesser extent, fascists were very active among the unemployed and angry, and many others feared revolution. In the South, the CCC provided work and pay for rural young men, too, in segregated camps across the face of the old Confederacy. Land reclamation, tree planting, trail improvement, and dozens of other projects, along with building and maintaining camps under semi-military discipline and organization, provided money to the workers' families and acted as a social safety valve. The federal government also created its first major infrastructure project, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that Nebraska Senator George Norris had advocated since before the Mississippi River floods of 1927. TVA had multiple objectives, dam construction for flood control and hydroelectric generation in order to modernize the Southern Appalachians and Tennessee River Valley, and employment to relieve the extreme poverty of the valley. TVA was designed to become a model for even more massive land rehabilitation projects in the far west. The Agricultural Adjustment Act also affected the South directly. Economists had blamed low commodity prices on the oversupply of those commodities, so the AAA paid landowners to take land out of production for basic commodities, wheat, cotton, corn, hogs, tobacco, and rice. In that first year, 1933, farmers plowed under 10.5 million acres of cotton and slaughtered 6 million piglets. They also poured out thousands of gallons of milk. All of this went against the farmers' basic conceptions of right, for they knew millions were in want. One of the most problematic things about the AAA was that payments for not growing crops went to landowners particularly large landowners, who were supposed to pay their tenants and renters, but who often just threw them off the land. More about this in a minute. The National Industrial Recovery Act attacked manufacturing and service industries from a similar perspective, that oversupply had led to cutthroat pricing. Industries were encouraged to form trade associations and write codes of fair competition that established prices and wages and prohibited various practices. Section 7A of the NIRA maintained that to be approved, all codes had to recognize the right of workers to organize. This led to a unionizing and strike boom in 1934. In the South, coal and iron mining and textile manufacturing were most affected by both the codes of fair competition and especially the Section 7A language. Regardless, by the time the Supreme Court declared the NIRA unconstitutional in 1935 and threatened to declare the AAA and many other New Deal programs unconstitutional in the following few years, the American South remained the most obvious economic problem in the United States. As the Roosevelt administration tamped down Supreme Court challenges and began its 1936 and 1938 election campaigns, it recognized that its future and the future of the U.S. depended in great part on rectifying the political economy of the South. Many experts associated with the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal sought a particular kind of recovery that we consider today to accommodate corporate capitalism as regulated by the government. This is an extension of progressive era political economy. The prevailing ideology promoted higher living standards through economic growth. These things were good in themselves and had few downsides, people then thought. 
The economy achieved these goals by maximizing capacity of all economic segments and actors and by privileging maximum resource use. To measure success, economists and policymakers sought out statistics on output and consumption because these things are measurable. Although it's difficult for us to see, there are other goals they could have chosen and other ways to judge success. The Roosevelt administration was conflicted, so its policy sometimes favored big farms and businesses, and sometimes favored small farms and businesses, and sometimes even workers. But many small farmers thought the government stopped short of supporting them and a way of life that were much more traditional, not driven to maximize capacity, toward the end of the New Deal era and at the beginning of the Second World War. To get a grip on the problems of the South and bolster the midterm elections, FDR had the National Emergency Council complete the report you see here, the report on the economic conditions of the South. In 15 sections, it lays out those problems, but without proposing any solutions. Applying existing solutions and coming up with new ones was what FDR wanted the new Congress to do assuming he could get his candidates elected. The report itself was a long litany of problems that compared the South to national averages, always finding that the South lagged far behind. Some of the findings were that the population was exceptionally young and old, with the most productive age ranges leaving both farms and the South for better opportunities. There were high rates of unemployment and underemployment that could only be rectified by providing full-time jobs in both cities and rural areas. Personal and public income was only 56% of the national average, which meant that poverty was rife, governments could not fund themselves or provide relief. Consequently, educational opportunities were missing. In 1930, 9% of Southerners were illiterate compared with 2% in the North Central states, and schools spent only 50% of the national average per pupil. Health was poor across the board, and housing was inadequate for over 4 million people. Labor was unskilled and too mobile, leading to structural underemployment, and there were still far too many instances of child labor. Industry and finance suffered from lack of capacity in similar ways. Programs to address some of these problems exposed in the 1938 report had existed as part of the so-called Second New Deal that began in 1935. Relief and improved public infrastructure came from the newly established Works Progress Administration. The WPA employed workers to build things like libraries and park buildings, as well as to pay contractors to build public buildings like schools, courthouses, jails, and bridges. In many cases, these workers labored under skilled craftsmen and began to learn a trade. Other WPA programs paid for writers to produce guidebooks to states, architects to document and photograph historical buildings, graphics artists to paint public murals, and even theater people to write and produce plays. The WPA hired ethnographers to record narratives from the formerly enslaved in the South many of whom were in their advanced years. The National Youth Administration, NYA, was similar, but aimed at the 16 to 25 age range. The NYA was open to women, unlike the Civilian Conservation Corps, and paid stipends for projects in schools and vocational training. Alabamian Aubrey Williams headed the NYA, assisted by Mary McLeod Bethune as head of the Division of Negro Affairs. Young Lyndon B. Johnson, a Texas teacher, headed the Texas division at one point, thus beginning his political career that landed him the presidency from 1963 until 1969. The South benefited most from changes in the Agricultural Adjustment Act and the newly created Farm Security Administration, FSA. Complaints about how crop payments were distributed prior to 1936 led the AAA to stop paying landowners and pay tenants or sharecroppers directly. 
This was a giant leap toward wrecking the now odious crop lien system. Direct payments provided a revenue stream to croppers and tenants outside the power structure of landlords and furnishing merchants who had kept farm workers impoverished. The FSA was an experiment to spread farm ownership in two ways. The first was rural relocation. The FSA created a few experimental cooperative farms that provided a country town base of operations to residents who relocated as well as land to farm. These were not widely successful because the federal government was unable to fully commit to them for political reasons. The much more successful FSA program was targeted loans for rural rehabilitation. Some tenants used these low interest loans to buy land. Some small owners bought more land. Many improved their housing and learned new farm techniques. The targeted loan program was successful, but because of the politics of the late 30s and early 40s, the federal government stopped supporting thousands of small holders in favor of creating large farms that were similar to factories, emphasized efficiency, and could change crops as well as absorb price shocks with greater ease than small farms. Finally, for both small and large farmers, the federal government provided services directly to improve farm life. One of the most serious problems in the South was soil erosion. So the feds created the Soil Conservation Service to teach farmers how to better care for their topsoil. The TVA, which I described above, and the Rural Electrification Administration go hand in hand. The TVA set up 15 dams along the Tennessee River and its tributaries and provided public electric power to businesses and individuals. Where far families live too far from the main electrical lines for private companies to provide power, the REA provided grants to string lines. Most of the rural South received electrical power after 1939 from REA work. REA also established rural power cooperatives to buy power at reduced rates from private providers. Many of these cooperatives continue to exist. The Farm Home Administration absorbed the FSA in the 1940s and focused on providing improvement loans to farmers who mechanized and industrialized their work. Although outside the romantic ideal of the New Deal's focus on the forgotten man, the FHA is responsible for the dramatic shift in southern agriculture from mule to tractor that occurred with great gusto after World War II. In summary, the economy of the 1920s, some of which was as roaring as the Jazz Age, barely affected most of the South. Prosperity in industrialized cities was exceptional, but the further south one went, and the further into the countryside one went, the less prosperity followed. The Great Migration continued to pull workers and brains away from the mostly impoverished south, and we see a bifurcation of population with lots of very old and very young people, as well as concentration of land and wealth. The U.S. economy overheated in the 1920s with too much loose cash in the system along with too much income inequality. There was a stock market bubble that many thought would last forever, but leading economic indicators show us now that the economy was faltering after 1928. A series of national and international shocks, as well as the unfortunately inadequate response of the federal government under Herbert Hoover, created a cascade of calamity that took the massive federal spending of World War II to stop. Not that the new president in 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt, didn't try. Congress passed corrective legislation in 1933 called the New Deal, and after part of it was declared unconstitutional in 1935, Roosevelt protected the remainder and added acts in what some historians have called the Second New Deal. Some of the original New Deal, and much of the second round, affected the South, which was still overwhelmingly rural. The most important measures were the revamped Agricultural Adjustment Act that sent crop payments directly to croppers and tenants, bypassing the existing power structure of landlords and furnishing merchants. The Farm Security Administration's relocation program helped Southerners, 
but its targeted loan program helped even more. Improvement in rural infrastructure came with the TVA and the Rural Electrification Administration that brought electric power to most of the rural South. The 1938 report of the National Emergency Council that identified 15 areas that led it to call the South the nation's number one economic problem was still true and would remain so. But the New Deal and federal spending in World War II at least tried to alleviate some of those issues. Well, this ends the lecture, and as always, thanks for your attention.